Good morning, everyone. Good morning. And happy Easter. We serve a risen Savior, so each week we should be rejoicing. It, it shouldn't be just once a year, but uh, um, on a daily basis, I think. Um, we, and we're reminded that through our faith, faith in Jesus, we have access to his resurrection power. We have some announcements this morning. Uh, Children's Sunday School resumes next Sunday, May 2nd, at 10.30 in the gym. Contact the church office if you have any questions. The Potter's Men's Group resumes at 6 p.m. on the second Thursday of May. Contact Don Hendrick if you have any questions about that. And a uh, book study is going to start on May 5th. It's called Not a Fan. Uh, the books are available in the church office for $10 each. And do we have a video on that? Do we have the video? Okay.
prayer walk that starts tomorrow. Mark, did you want to mm -hmm. give us a little more information on that, the times? Um, we're going to meet at 8.30 here in the sanctuary tomorrow morning. And, 8 30 uh, tomorrow morning meet in the sanctuary yeah. and we're uh, more than likely we're going to be going to the schools and the churches to pray over those buildings and the, and the people in them all right so splitting into small groups to go to um churches and schools primarily starting out with and um pray over those those areas and those buildings and, and then go from there. And I, I hope everybody can, can come. If you can't, you can give us your telephone number. We can call you and tell you where we're at. So you can kind of just pray with us. Okay. All right. You can follow along if you want to um, give them your number. And I believe, then did I hear also then next Saturday as well? Correct. Is that the other time next Saturday? Yeah. stay on track. God moments. Testimonies. Any witnesses? Are we, do we have a mic that we want to pass around for this one? The one on music? Oh, you get to take it. Okay. All right. Anybody have anything they want to share this morning before I pull it up there? I'll drag the mic around for you. Oh. <laughs> oh there we go. Got it. Anybody? God moments? Youper. <laughs> Actually, I have many. Um, you know, you know how blessed I am. I mean, I got a, a God. God gave me a family that, to me, is like no other. Um, thank God for being with Carrie when she was fearful and for watching over her and for Lisa's family when their mother was killed at Palmer. Um, how God comforts us is, is a, it's amazing. The more that we look for Him, the more that we seek Him, better off we are because we become less of us and more of him. And um, I, I'm just blessed. I just want to say that thank you God for for blessing me. Anybody else? Thank you, Mark. I agree. I'm, I'm blessed as well. I guess this week, if I were to pick something out, it's just doing some community work with the college. And you get in with kids, and you have fun, and you can do good things. And it's not um, representing the church, really. It's representing the work at Blackhawk College. But in the middle of everything, you realize, no, nah, it's, it's all part of, you know, being blessed and trying to spread the good news maybe in a different context, but um, I encourage everybody to do that sort of thing. I uh, just wanted to uh, say that my dad was having some health issues this week and he is doing better now, so I am thankful for that and hope he continues to, to bounce back. Anybody else? Okay. Nope. I was very blessed this last week, I'd say, with my missions group that I go to Mexico with. We have one of us that shares a small devotion or just words once a week. And this last week was my week to share. And at times, it's like, okay, trying to prepare. I didn't know what exactly to say, but God gave me the words to say, and it really reached 
one of my friends and that I say, God, put those words through me for them. And that's what I told, told them. It's like they were there just for you. Mark, continued prayers for my friend Emily and for good retest results. Is there any progress? Not yet. Okay, how's that? Okay. Um, I'll share a, um, introduce myself and, and share a little moment, I think, uh, with you. Uh, I'm Kelly Larimer. I'm from rural Varna, very rural, that's what they say. <laughs> and um, I'm an hour east of here. And it was a beautiful drive coming across um, to here this morning. Um, I've been married 40 years. Lots of God moments, <laughs> but lots of stress too, I'm sure. <laughs> Those that are married can relate. But um, I'm, I'm thankful for. Uh, some answered prayers and, and things that were a bumpy road here somewhat recently. I'm, I'm very thankful and um, I have to keep remembering um, faith. And um, we have three grown children. I have eight grandchildren. They range in age from four to 14. And um, it's hard to keep up with everything and, and everybody. I was a preschool teacher for 35 years, and um, I miss it, but it's time for me to be a student now, I think. And um, I want to not just be a fan, but a follower of the great teacher. And um, I wish I lived a little closer so that I could join you for the book study, but um, maybe we'll do that over in, in the little barn too. But I just want to just say, hang in there. <laughs> um, not all roads are as smooth and beautiful as the one I drove across this morning. But if we keep looking and, and keep our faith, um, that promise lies ahead of us. So if you would, bow your heads and we can open our <clears throat> Heavenly Father, as your family, we gather here today, not because we have to, but because we want to. We are here to offer you our worship, our prayers, and our lives in service to you and to our neighbor. We have as our example your son who chose not to rule but to serve. Lord, we know that you led your people of old throughout the wilderness and brought them into a land of promise. Guide now the people of your church that following our Savior we may walk through the wilderness of this world toward the glory of the world to come. Lead us to the promise of peace, forgiveness, and eternal life. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Do we have um, we have a prayer request I heard for Emily? Okay. Do we have any other prayer requests that was weighing on us that we'd like to lift up? J.D. Faulkner. J.D. Okay. Anybody, anything else? Your prayer walk, definitely. lives are, are broken by fear, for those whose lives are broken by anger and pain, those who are broken by illness or by sin, Lord. God of healing, gently touch those lives with your spirit. Bring warmth, comfort, wholeness, and restoration to them. 
we would also ask that you would grant wisdom for the leaders in our communities and in our world. Give them a heart to follow you as they serve. And now in, in one voice, join together. Hear us as we pray the, the prayer taught to the disciples. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Um, our scripture um, this morning, the first that I'd like to share with you is from Luke 7, verses 36 through 50. And that's called Jesus Anointed by a Sinful Woman. One of the Pharisees asked Jesus to have dinner with him, so Jesus went to his home and sat down to eat. When a certain immoral woman from that city heard that he was eating there, she brought a beautiful alabaster jar filled with expensive perfume. Then she knelt behind him at his feet, weeping. Her tears fell on his feet, and she wiped them off with her hair. Then she kept kissing his feet and putting perfume on them. When the Pharisee who had invited him saw this, he said to himself, If this man were a prophet, he would know what kind of woman is touching him. She's a sinner. Jesus answered his thoughts. Simon, he said to the Pharisee, I have something to say to you. Go ahead, teacher, Simon replied. And then Jesus told him this story. A man loaned money to two people, 500 pieces of silver to one and 50 pieces to another. But neither of them could repay him, so he kindly forgave them both, canceling their debts. Who do you suppose loved him more after that? Simon answered, I suppose the one for whom he canceled the larger debt. That's right, Jesus said. And then he turned to the woman and said to Simon, Look at this woman kneeling here. When I entered your home, you didn't offer me water to wash the dust from my feet, but she has washed them with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You didn't greet me with a kiss, but from the first time I came in, she has not stopped kissing my feet. You neglected the courtesy of olive oil to anoint my head, but she has anointed my feet with rare perfume. I tell you, her sins, and they are many, have been forgiven, so she has shown me much love. But the person who has forgiven little shows only little love. Then Jesus said to the woman, Your sins are forgiven. The men at the table said among themselves, Who is this man that he goes around forgiving sins? And Jesus said to the woman, Your faith has saved you. Go in peace. Okay. Jesus accepted all kinds of invitations. He went to the home of the Pharisee. He went to the home of tax um, collectors. He went to the home of religious people. Wherever he was invited, he would go and join them. The scripture that I just shared with you from Luke 7 took place during Jesus' last week. In the book of Mark, it tells us that that was on Wednesday. In biblical times, when they gathered at the table uh, to dine, it was in a reclining position, not seated on chairs at tables like we do now, like we see here. So this woman was not crawling under the table to get to Jesus' feet. More so, he was, they were seated, um, oftentimes pillows, cushions, and so maybe he was sitting with his feet um, curved behind him a bit. Um, she came up behind him, and when Simon saw this, um, and what she was doing, he was very indignant with her actions. In the culture of that time, and still today, it's very inappropriate for a woman not related to a man to touch his feet. And even more so was the loosening of her hair. Everyone there would have been feeling very uncomfortable and critical. And Simon thought to himself, 
If Jesus is a prophet, as they had heard he was, he would know what kind of woman this was that was doing this. And not only was she doing this shameful behavior, she was also using a very expensive perfume um, that she brought in an alabaster jar, which was also a pricey item. Breaking the jar held symbolic meaning. Her sinful activities most likely had helped her to possess this expensive jar and the oil inside it. That was her past. It was also a symbolic representation of her future. By breaking the jar, it showed an act of repentance and dedication. She was breaking the past patterns of her life, saying no more sinful living, and she was also breaking her future certainty. Think about that part of the scripture for just a moment. Isn't this what God wants from all of us? To change our sinful nature? To give him all that we have? To trust him with our future? Jesus stops all the whispering and grumbling by knowing Simon's thoughts, which should have uh, confirmed that suspicion of whether or not he was a prophet. He tells the story of the two men with debt, and um, Simon answered the, answer, the question that Jesus asked him correctly, but he still truly did not understand it. But Jesus saw the heart of the matter and the heart of the woman, and he extended forgiveness doing it so that the others hearing it would have to welcome her back into the community as a woman with a new identity. Let's back up a little bit um, to the another aspect of the culture in that time. And it was co customary for hosts to provide a basin of water for the guests to wash their feet in. Um, some even had servants to do that job. Uh, usually the, the guests had been traveling for a bit to get there. They wore sandals. The roads and the paths were dusty, and so their feet were dirty. Uh, there was not a lot of opportunity or water along the way uh, for bathing. And so to freshen up the guests, host uh, usually provided an oil or perfume to put on so that the room full of travelers uh, did not make um, an offensive odor in the home. Simon did none of these things. He basically opened the door and walked back into the house. He did nothing to welcome them in or offer hospitality. He was by no means a gracious host. The woman did all of these things as a way of showing her love for her Lord. I'd like to share a, a second story with you now. Um, it uh, also is um, based on scripture but um, a little bit different. It's, it's told in the first person. And the man that wrote it, his name was Keith Manry. And I found it um, one time when I was preparing for, for Holy Week. And, and um, I came across it. And I'd like to share that with you now. <clears throat> Excuse me. Your Bible doesn't give me a name, but this story really isn't about me. It's about a man and a meal. I lived in what you uh, know as first century in the city of Jerusalem. It wasn't a bad time to live in Jerusalem. Apart from the Roman occupation, the city was thriving like never before. We lived in the southwest corner of the city, and it's a neighborhood known for its limestone one- and two-story buildings that sit um, almost on top of each other, lots of winding streets and alleys. Our neighborhood was what you might call today a blue-collar community. We had plenty of work to do during the time of great feasts. You see, three times a year, our city went from a population of 25,000 to well over 100,000 for an entire week. From all over, my fellow Jews who lived outside of Jerusalem would come to town. It was springtime, and one of the most important feasts of our faith was about to get underway. And if you know much about my people, you're probably aware of our history with Pharaoh and Moses and our exodus from Egypt. We celebrated every year after the, those events and remembered God's mercy and deliverance by again telling that story 
and participating those in those same actions of slaughtering a lamb and making bread without leaven. It became a feast, the Passover feast, or the Feast of the Unleavened Bread, as it's sometimes called, and it's one of the most important uh, feasts to our people. This year was no different than any other. There was a tremendous amount of preparation to be done. No other festival requires the kind of work that Passover does. The first thing we had to take care of was to make sure that there wasn't even the slightest amount of leaven in our home. The house had to be turned upside down and cleaned ex extensively, which became known as spring cleaning. The house was ready. I don't know whether you stay up late at night or not before a holiday getting ready, but we had been up late trying to make all of our final preparations. The lamb was to be purchased the next day and we'd already calculated the exact amount that we needed for our family. Um, for Jewish law mandated that the lamb that day could not be wasted or left over. It all had to be eaten. We'd been up only a few hours the next morning when two men began approaching our home with one of our servants who had gone to retrieve water. They looked familiar, and then it hit me. I had seen them just a few days earlier in the temple court. I had gone up to worship and pray as I did on a regular basis when all of a sudden this guy came out of nowhere and started turning the tables and, and flipping things over where the men were selling doves for sacrifices and exchanging currency. As some screwed after all the loose coins, I couldn't take my eyes off this guy. There was something different about him. He began teaching and I was amazed. His message was one I had never heard before. And these guys, the ones coming up to my house, they were there, by his side. I knew it was them. As they stepped up to the door, they said to me, the teacher asks, where is my guest room where I may eat the Passover with my disciples? He? Your teacher wants to have the Passover in my house? I was speechless for a moment and a bit confused. I'd never actually met him. How did he know that I had been amazed at the temple? Was my reaction that obvious? Had he sent someone to follow me? No, that didn't seem likely. But how had these guys known to follow my servant who wasn't even with me that day? I'm not sure what I said, but the next thing I know, I was walking through the house and showing them the room that we had already set up for our family for the evening meal. After they had gone out later, we moved on with the preparations for the day. I, um, I just could not get over it. All day I thought about it, and as we were finishing putting the meal on the table, my son came running upstairs to tell me that they were here. I'd been waiting all day for this moment. I can't tell you how glad I was that we had thoroughly cleaned the house when he showed up. From the moment that he walked in the door, it was as if purity and holiness filled our home. It's hard to put into words. In some strange way, I felt warm on the inside, but I had goosebumps at the same time. And the hairs on the back of my neck stood up. And I knew when he greeted me that there was something different about this man. I showed him to the upper room where he and his disciples could eat. And as I started leaving, he called me by name. I want you and your family to join us. He didn't have to ask twice. Eat with him? I couldn't be more honored. I went downstairs and got the kids and my wife and we went up and we reclined for the meal. I was accustomed to leading the ceremony and readings for the feast, but not that night. I wanted him to have that honor. After he began, began the feast, when it came time for a child to typically ask the questions about the meaning of the meal as had been done for centuries, he turned and he looked across the room at my son with love in his eyes. 
His disciples seemed a bit shocked, and they all grew silent when he, with a loving nod, signaled to my boy to proceed with the traditional questions. My son, with a confidence that I at the moment don't think I could have possessed, asked the questions that had been asked for so many years. I had never seen a teacher of that caliber treat a young child with so much love and dignity. The festivities of the evening continued, and the conversation around the table was lively. The appetizers and the wine had been served, and the main course was now on the table. He hadn't said much throughout the evening. In fact, on a few occasions, I'm certain that I saw him wipe a tear from the corner of his eyes. In a brief moment of silence, with everyone's mouths were, when they were full, he spoke. I tell you the truth, he said, looking around at the twelve that were gathered with him. One of you will betray me, one who is eating with me. You could hear a pin drop. Suddenly, everything came to a screeching halt, and one by one, his disciples inquired, It isn't I, is it? It is one of the twelve who dips bread into the bowl with me. They'd all been dipping bread into the bowl, but it was a bowl of stewed fruit. They all stopped dipping and eating as he continued. The Son of Man will go just as it is written about him. But woe to the man who betrays the Son of Man. It would be better if he had not been born. Go? You just got here. You just showed up in Jerusalem. There are so many people who need to hear your teachings. We don't have any other teachers like you. And I need you. You saw things about me. You know where I live. You used my house and made my family a part of yours for the evening. I want to get to know you better. And one of your twelve will betray you? Point him out. Who's the traitor? Let me at him. By that point, I was so confused. I was angry. I didn't know what to think. And I'd lost my appetite. For a few minutes, the disciples went back to eating. But this time, it was in silence. I don't think they knew what to say after what they just heard. But then he broke the silence again. He took some of the matzah, the bread that we had prepared that day without the leaven, and um, he gave thanks to God, and he broke it, and he said, Take, eat, this is my body. Your body? What do you mean, your body? I had no idea what he was talking about, and judging from the expressions on the disciples' face, they didn't either. When the food was gone and it was time for the, the last glasses of wine to be served and in the feast, he took the cup of wine, he prayed a prayer of thanksgiving, and he gave it to his disciples and they drank from it. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for many. I know the sound of having drunk blood is strange, but that's not what I was thinking of at that moment. He said his blood was being shed for many. I wasn't hearing things. That was actually the way he phrased it. Not something in the past or something in the future, but something of the present, as if he knew that something was already in the works. Like this traitor that he had spoken of was already up to no good, and plans for his death were underway. Like he was already dying. And shed for many, <coughs> What did he mean by that? It wouldn't all come together for another 24 hours. He thanked me as they left my house that evening. I walked back upstairs and sat down across from where he'd been sitting, the place of honor at the table where I normally sat. It was a place I would never sit again. It would always be his. There in front of me were the bread and the wine, or in his words, his body and blood. What had just happened? Who was this Jesus? And why had he seen fit to have the Passover in my home? In the weeks following that 24 hour period, I spent many hours in that upper room. It did all come together for me. 
His body and his blood were about to be given for all of mankind. What he had done at my table was a way of pointing to the sacrifice he was about to make. Passover was never again the same for our family. It could be after what we had witnessed that evening. The stories that we've heard um, came in, in during Holy Week, right before Easter. And uh, right now I'd, I'd like you to think a little bit about Christmas. That night in Bethlehem many years ago when Jesus was born. The innkeeper didn't open the door. He didn't invite Mary and Joseph in and he showed little hospitality. He pointed to the stable out back. He missed the opportunity. Many still do. They let the birth of Jesus pass them by. In today's scripture about the sinful woman, Simon opened the door to Jesus, but that was it. He missed the opportunity to take care of Jesus' needs. He neglected him, and many still do. They let him pass by and, and turn their heads like they're above such actions. Jesus told many parables and gave much instruction to his disciples in the day before the Last Supper. They did not understand everything at the time. In Matthew 25, verses 34 through 40, we find that he told them this. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. And then the righteous will answer and say, Lord, when did we see you hungry or feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or, or naked and clothe you? When did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of my brothers, you did it to me. He goes on to say to those on his left, to depart from him into the eternal fire, for they did nothing for others. And in John's account of the Last Supper, in chapter 13, verses 12 through 17, it says, After washing their feet, he put on his robe again, and sat down and asked, Do you understand what I was doing? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, because that's what I am. And since I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you ought to wash each other's feet. I have given you an example to follow. Do as I have done to you. I tell you the truth. Slaves are not greater than their master, nor is the messenger more important than the one who sends the message. And now that you know these things, God will bless you for doing them. Jesus told us what to do as his followers. A last bit of, of scripture for you comes from Romans 12, verses 1 through 8. And so, dear brothers and sisters, I plead with you to give your bodies to God because of all he has done for you. Let them be a living and holy sacrifice, the kind that he will find acceptable. This is truly the way to worship him. Don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you will learn to know God's will for you, which is good, and pleasing and perfect. Because of the privilege and authority God has given me, I give you each this warning. Don't think you are better than you really are. Be honest in your evaluation of yourselves, measuring yourselves by the faith God has given you. Just as our bodies have many parts and each part has a special function, so it is with Christ's body. 
We are many parts of one body, and we all belong to each other. In his grace, God has given us different gifts for doing certain things well. So if God has given you the ability to prophesy, speak out with as much faith as God has given you. If your gift is serving others, serve them well. If you are a teacher, teach well. If your gift is to encourage others, be encouraging. If it is giving, give generously. If God has given you leadership ability, take the responsibility seriously. And if you have a gift for showing kindness to others, do it gladly. Uh, Romans is often called the theology textbook because of its detailed explanation of the Christian life. It spells out what God wants us to do in our daily living. Verses 1 and 2 tell us that we should dedicate ourselves to God and get rid of distractions so that we know his will for us. Verse 3 is, is great instruction for our journey through life and our self-examination. We shouldn't think that we are better than others. Verses 6 and 8 tell us how to live, how to use the spiritual gifts that we've been blessed with. And verses 7 and 8 describe the spiritual practice of hospitality. Offering hospitality shows Christ to others. It allows the abundant love that he has given to us to flow out on others. It shouldn't be about gaining favor or being the perfect host, but about becoming more like Christ. We can do these things by taking meals to shut-ins, those that are sick, inviting someone to go for coffee, uh, offering a place to stay for someone visiting, taking someone to appointment. And in our churches, we can greet folks with a smile and a kind word. In closing, I want you to think about the joy that filled the man who opened the door when Jesus wanted to come into his home. He gave up his seat at the table, and his life would never be the same. He witnessed a part of the most extraordinary moment in time, and he was so glad that he did not miss the opportunity. I encourage all of you to open the door to Jesus and others. Don't let opportunity pass you by. And remember that when hospitality um, um, is given, that we should always receive it with gratitude. Amen? Amen. And amen.
comes every good and perfect gift. We give you praise and thanks. Give us a heart to love and serve you. Enable us to show our thankfulness for all your goodness and mercy by giving ourselves up to your service, cheerfully showing love and kindness to all we meet. Grant, O oh Lord, that what we have said with our lips we may believe in our hearts and practice in our lives. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And may the grace of God and our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Go in peace.